In the education sector, there are lots of examples of initiatives that are scaling. Bridge International Academies, many of you know, based out of uh, started in Kenya, and their break-even point is 500,000 students. They're also a group of young Americans who have come, and they're now in a few countries in East Africa, and they've entered Nigeria. <coughs> How many of you know your break-even points? So they say 500,000 students. That challenges me. I don't know if it challenges you. <laughs> Pioneer Academy started by a Nigerian, has started in Kenya and South Africa, and they want to have 100 schools in 10 years. Um, and there are many other examples. It can by youth in South Africa as well. That are scaling. And Bridge uses a lot of technology. It doesn't say it's giving the state of art education to kids. It's bare bones, but slightly higher than the public schools. Slightly higher. Now, there are lots of contentions around whether that's good enough, but they're trying to scale and they seem to be making progress. ICAPA has a very interesting model where it's basically working with governments and in partnership with governments, and it's measuring its impact by having a control group. So those who don't go through ICAMVA and those who go through ICAMVA, the government gives this credible data and it can measure. And then it's also a peer-led group uh, program where those who have gone through become the teachers. Um, and they give back and they pay it forward. So I'll end up by saying the bulk of my book focuses exclusively on the social innovator, the visionary, what they need to do to ensure that they embed scale into their DNA. And if you're like me who started an organization without thinking about scale from the beginning, it also helps you think through how you can go back and retool and rethink your model. But beyond that, there are also recommendations for the governments. I think governments in Africa have to also change their mindset. Many of us <coughs> feel that governments want to compete with us as opposed to partner. So there's a need for an enabling environment for social innovators to thrive. There's a need for tax incentives. In many of our countries, we still don't have any tax incentives for those who want to invest in social innovation. And I actually think that every government agency should have a desk called an innovation desk, where they are looking for high impact innovations that are working at the grassroots and enabling them to scale. President Obama did that in the United States and it worked really, really well. Similarly, the private sector, development partners, foundations, and academia have to invest a lot more in understanding scaling and researching scaling. Now for me, after writing this book, I had to go and say charity begins at home. So LEAP had 13 programs in 2014. <coughs> By 2015, we had narrowed our focus to three. We said, what is our cost per beneficiary? Should we be doing all of these expensive yeah. programs if we want to scale? Instead of reaching individuals one-on-one, -on -one, should we be training teachers to deliver our curriculum? So we changed our model. And we also invested in e-learning. And one of our first e-learning products, which I'm really excited about, is called e-integrity. So we've been teaching ethics for 14 years and teaching, reaching hundreds of people. Now, through our e-integrity, we're reaching millions. And it's a great tool that allows you to do a survey at the beginning, a test at the end, to see if you've changed mindsets. There are lots of games and scenarios and interactive exercises. And we really believe that through our e-learning modules, we're going to scale the impact of our work. So I want to end with my personal dream. My personal dream is that we work ourselves out of our jobs. If, we come, if I come back to London 20 years from now, and many of you are still doing the same thing, then I believe we would have said we failed, right? We failed our generation. We failed our children's generation. Um, and especially in the development space, it's easy to get into the trap. Earlier today, we had a breakfast with African philanthropists. And somebody said, whenever I see large jeeps and uh, you know, that have a logo on it in Africa, I will not fund them. <laughs> That's what they said. But the truth is, many of these jobs are so cushy. So it's nice to stay in them and try to keep your job at all costs. When keeping your job means that you're not making any impact. Because if you were, you would lose your job. They wouldn't need you to solve that problem. You could move on to the next social problem. So my desire is that we work ourselves out of our jobs in our lifetime. And I love this quote from the book, which says, social and is <coughs> not consent just to give a fish or teach how to fish. Mm -hmm. They will not rest until they have revolutionized the fishing industry. Mm -hmm. And I think for all of us, we really have to think about the root causes of problems and try to be catalytic in our efforts to change our society. And then finally, my favorite quote, which I use all the time, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. 
you cannot scale <coughs> in isolation. Mm -hmm. Yesterday at LSE was really interesting because there are people in that room who should be working together. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of them should be working with that Ford. And I told them, I said, why aren't you working with that Ford? In the UK, guys, the, we need to grow our pie yeah. instead of fighting for the crumbs. Mm -hmm. And I realized that this is, this is a problem. I thought it was just on the continent. Now I'm in the UK and I'm telling people to connect. <laughs> this is that. <laughs> We need to grow the pie. We need to partner. We need to partner across, across sectors. We need to partner within our sectors. We need to partner with the government. Mm -hmm. That's the only way we're going to solve our problems. I don't want to be scared every day when I'm driving on the street because I haven't done the work we're supposed to do to change lives and to transform communities. So I'm depending on you to work with me and work with each other to build the Africa of our dreams. Thank you very much. Thank you. Africa, and you know, you're sharing some of the numbers with being realistic and sort of considering the resources and the state that you're at. So, right now in my organization, I'm trying to think five years from now, but my reality is today. So, you know, what, what advice do you have for that in terms of, you know, sort of coming up with your, uh, your vision? Okay, so I would say that it really depends on the entrepreneur. So, what is propelling you to want to solve a problem? What is propelling you? And how deep is your, your reach? When we started LEAP, we called it LEAP Africa. We didn't call it LEAP Nigeria. Okay? LEAP is 14 years old and we're still LEAP Nigeria. Really, we're LEAP Nigeria because we started the work and realized that the problems, I mean, the numbers was, I mean, it's huge in Nigeria. You could get swallowed up. And so the only way we will now become LEAP Africa is through others coming to take the vision and replicating it. So for me, I called it Deep Africa. And then I started the work and realized, my gosh, this is not going to scale through Africa. So I always ask people, what is your ultimate vision? With A Foods, we're very clear. We were most inspired by Nestle. And I happen to serve on the board of Nestle. So when people introduce me, I say, Didi used to say in the beginning, she wants to be the Nestle of Africa. But what we <coughs> was, was that we're going to transform food processing landscape and build a company that was world class <coughs> and could rival any multinational. Mm -hmm. But that was our vision. Now there are some people who come in and say, you know what, my vision is to stop um, rape in Lagos. And that's a big enough vision. But that's what your vision, like that's your area of interest and passion. So I would say every entrepreneur needs to figure out what makes them angry, what drives them, and where their passion lies, who are they most passionate about serving? Because it's, it's important to set stretch goals, but don't set goals outside your area of passion. I would say passion is the limit, because this is tough stuff. It, it's draining emotionally, physically, spiritually. It's tough. So if you're not, if you don't care, I mean, really, what's going on in, I mean, I, I wouldn't set up an organization that's a global organization because I'm very clear that my passion is African. Yeah. Do you understand? So yeah. some people, their passion is the world. They're citizens of the world. They'll tell you they're citizens of the world. I'm yeah. very clear that my focus is Africa and people are <coughs> African descent. So you have to figure out what your passion is. That will guide the frame that you put around your vision. Another thing you focus on in your book is the importance of values, so the values of an organization. So I wanted to, uh, my second question is about values and how you build those into the, the DNA of the organization as you scale. So you talked about to scale, sometimes you're going to have to work through partnerships, you're going to have to work, you know, across, if you want to go across geographies. How do you manage to sort of, and how have you done it with the organization to pass on those values as you scale? So values are so important. And your values are your non-negotiables. Meaning, what are you, you know, they say everybody has a price. What are you, um, you know, you're not willing to compromise on this aspect of who you are. And I, I, our first book at LEAP was called Define the Odds, Case Studies of Nigerian Companies That Have Survived Generations. And we wrote this book because so many companies were dying with their founders. And when we asked the founders who had survived generations why they did, they said values. And they could articulate what that founder values were and how that founder passed it on to the next generation and the third and the fourth. So for me, you can have a long list of things that you care about, but you have to pick three to four that are non-negotiable. And 
At Ace Foods, we used to make the staff recite it every day. <laughs> like ethics. You know, ethics and food in Africa is a whole discussion that I hope Afford will take on one day. But being in this industry has made me realize how much unethical behavior exists. So one of our biggest products is chili pepper. You guys know chili pepper? Hot pepper. Mm -hmm. huh? We produce it for noodle companies, we, we sell it to fast food companies, and then we have it in retail shops. We have about 12 products in retail shops. Now what struck us when we started was we're doing B2B, business to business. One of our customers said, you guys are so expensive, you're three times the price of your competitor. And we said, okay, give us the samples. So they gave us the samples. And we found out it was corn, dyed red, with um, extracts that make it smell like pepper. Mm -hmm. Now the dye is carcinogenic, oh, it's Sudan red. And so it's very tempting, right? Corn at that time was 50 naira per kg. Chili pepper was 500 naira per kg. So you can already see the temptation. I can make 500 times uh, uh, profits. And you ask, and if we buy for 500, we're making a 10% margin. They're making <coughs> multiples. And so the customer said, match this product. <coughs> match it. We'll buy from you if you match it. So it was a very tempting. Your customer is selling you to match it. <laughs> Give them what they want. <laughs> but because ethics, such an important part of our values. Yeah. It was an internal debate. Some of the staff did not agree with my cons I said, we've written, Leap has written two books on ethics. I teach <laughs> ethics. Let people catch us selling dyed uh, <laughs> corn as chili. Um, but if you don't have those values, you always find an opportunity to cut costs, yeah. to cut corners, <clears throat> to make compromises. And, and I'm using food, but in every space. And those values are what keeps you focused on why you started and ensures that you don't deviate from who you are and what you stand for, your essence and your being. It also means you attract the same people. You attract like-minded people mm -hmm. and you also attract long-term partners who know that they can trust you when everything else fails. And so in this current recession, our company is doing very well because people know they can trust us. And that our, our products are 100% natural. And what we put in is what we say we put in. So ultimately, in the long term, you win. In the short term, it's painful. Mm. Yeah. Um, I guess my next question is, um, is about scale. Um, and you, you, you touched on the example of bridge academies. There are, you know, when we talk about scaling social innovation, they are sort of one of the case studies that we look at now. In you know, five years, they're in five countries, over 100,000 children just in Kenya, very data driven, very quality focused. Um, however, I'm from Uganda and they've been having trouble in Uganda. So the government, I, I don't know if some of you heard of that, but the government seemed to shut down Bridge Academy schools um, in Uganda. And you know, there's outrage from the parents. This is you know, about 12,000 kids out of school you know, towards the end of the term, 800 teachers out of work. Um, but we were, we were talking about this uh, uh, as a case study recently, and, and we're trying to understand, you know, where where did they go wrong? And you know, we, we, we talked about they didn't get that buy-in, you know, like you talked about that collaborators maybe partnering with the openness. But then it, it, it brought us to the question of how do you get buy-in at scale? So with Bridge, for example, if they're in Uganda, Kenya, Nigeria, India, Liberia, <coughs> those are all different, you know, markets, different players, with different interests. You know, the government of Liberia invited them, while in Uganda, the government of Uganda is trying to kill them. So it, 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 it brought us back to the question of how would you get that buy-in at scale? Because, you know, building that, those relationships, understanding, you know, like you mentioned, there was an organization where it took two years to change someone's yeah. mindset, you know? Um, how do you match, what do you think is the way to sort of balance that out? So that's why I think the pathways to scale is very interesting. And every organization has to figure out what that pathway is. I would say for Bridge, the pathway to scale for them is really about partnerships like you've mentioned. But in each country, they have, they've done this map. And maybe in Uganda, they, they didn't do it as well. Yeah. But in Nigeria, they've been very strategic. And so they got the buy-in from the government very early. Mm. Because they recognize that in education, the government is such an important stakeholder. Yeah. And then the second thing is that they had to tweak the model for Nigeria. In Nigeria, they couldn't give the bare bones, um, zinc, 
classrooms, um, they had to up their game a bit and they had to tailor the curriculum to the Nigerian context and they're growing rapidly in Nigeria. Yeah. So I would say their model um, is, is, a, a, is, is really driven by them growing organically, mm -hmm. but they're growing really quickly organically and their limit is talent. Yeah. And that's what they will tell you, their limit. Because they get their donor darling, so their money is not their problem, their, their problem is talent. So I would say every organization has to figure out their pathway. I mentioned that LEAP's pathway has to be that the government adopts our curriculum for one of our programs. Yeah. Um, because ultimately, that's the fastest way for us to, yeah. to reach the numbers. Um, there are many pathways. There are hundreds and hundreds of approaches to scaling. The challenge is how do you scale without sacrificing quality? Yeah. How do you scale without upsetting stakeholders? So you have to keep going back to that map. You have to go back to the map for every community. Every community is going to be different. And that's what people don't understand. We work, LEAP works in, in 20, has worked in 26 states in Nigeria. Every state is different. Every local government is different. Because of the heterogeneity that I talked about, yeah. you can't assume that what works in, in Lagos is going to work in Aba. Yeah. It won't. And then my final question is, so there's a few people in the room that are going to go back, take those ideas out of the folder. What are some sort of top you know, top one thing that you would say they should focus on when it comes from moving from idea, from vision, to actually, you know, taking action. And, you know, based on your experience, you know, if you could go back, what's that one thing you'd focus on straight from, you know, have yeah. my idea and... So I always tell people, you have to have a board. And obviously I've written a book on governance and boards. I think a board is critical. Many people don't like to start up with a board. The minute I have an idea, I find board members. Because the first thing they do is they help you test out that idea. They will tell you, no, 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 refine it this way. Um, maybe think about this. They will challenge your assumptions. They have experience. They have credibility. I always say on a board, you need a lawyer who is not a paid lawyer. That person is there to provide legal support. You need a finance and accounting person, not someone who is on your payroll, but someone who's, that's the area of expertise. You need a subject matter expert. You need someone who is a branding and media expert. Those four are critical. So when we're starting Ace Food, my husband and I are co-founders. He has a finance background. I have a strategy background. Has it, have, none of us knew anything about food technology, quality control. So we had to find people on our board to play those roles. Similarly with Leap Africa, with Sahel, with every organization we've started. And you don't have to pay board members from the beginning. Find people who share your values and your vision, who are willing to give you the time. And tell them in their letter that they're not going to be paid. That will test their commitment. <laughs> At ACE, we wrote them a for-profit, and we said for the first three years, we're not going to be able to pay you.